Welcome to the Arts to Hearts podcast, a show for artists, creators, creative entrepreneurs to have heartfelt conversations about living a creative life and a career. As you go into this show, hear your favorite creators talk about money, mindset, business, creativity, and everything else that goes behind into making a life that we all adore as an artist. Hear the messy and the wonderful side of being a creative. I am your host Charaka Arora, an artist, creator, and founder of Arts to Hearts Project. Thank you for joining me here. Let's jump right in. Okay, welcome to the podcast, Max. Finally, I am so excited that I literally have you right in front of my screen. Oh my goodness! Thank you so much for having me. You've been so incredibly uh, generous to invite me here. I'm such a fan of yours. Thank you. <laughs> so, I I I can say the same. Firstly, thank you so much. You and I have been doing this two and so I literally feel like I had to like I literally dragged you here on this screen. And <laughs> if I can be hundred percent honest, because you you ghosted me a couple of times before, I was like I I, I sent you a message and I was like. I just want to remind you, just in case if you're thinking of the same, you have to show up today. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I was so nervous. I'm yeah, so, I and I yeah, and I'm I'm so excited to talk more about that in general. I I've been going through so many changes in my life and my career right now. I was like, who even am I? Who could I? What could I even say on a podcast right now? And it's interesting, that's, but I find <laughs> that's such a good thing to say because you know what, even. Like, I have reached out to so many people, and this is a very common response a lot of times. Uh, someone would say, "Oh, I don't think I'm there yet." You know, I think someone else would have something better to say, and I'm like, "No, I want you. I want, I want to hear your story. I want to hear uh, your perspective and share that." And what, why, what was that that was holding you back? Like, let's start with that. I think this is interesting. Yeah. Well, truly, in the last year, I've struggled with my art career. I feel like I've had a very beautiful run the last five years or so. Like it, it, my my career kind of started in the last five years, and it was really organic and wonderful. And with the pandemic, you know, obviously things were shaken a bit in the art world, and I was still able to have you know three different solo shows in during the pandemic, which was incredible. I mean, yeah. that's wonderful. But behind the scenes, it was a struggle. Um, you know, I was struggling with my gallery. I, I was, I was struggling with um, mental health and I was moving studios and I just felt like everything was kind of turning in a different direction. And I, I, I kind of lost sight of what the future for my art career looks like. So I think I was a little bit nervous, but at this point, I'm just, maybe that's, you know, good raw material to sort through. And and I'm very happy to start from the beginning and think through like where I've been, but I I don't know exactly where my work is going. And I will see if this can become a therapy session. You know, (laughs) (laughs) I think we would, then let's, let's, let's hold on to this thought by the end. Okay. Okay. um, And see where we go. But you know Mm -hmm. what? I think, um, like you said, and I think this has so much, this, this has so much good. And I, I knew that talking to you would bring so many good things. Because, you know what, when I was looking at you, and I think we've been in touch for, I think, past, since the pandemic. I think the first time we spoke was in, in the beginning of the pandemic, I remember. Especially when you made that post that you, you moved your studio. And I remember that uh, you were saying you are in the middle of move and like everything. So it's been a long time. Even though, like, we've just been <laughs> coordinating the podcast. But, you know, since then, I, I have always felt that, you know, you had these shows. And, of course, I think just the scale and the beauty of your work also, like, you know, works like a magic spell, like, for me. And, but just on the genuine, you know, on a forefront for someone who's an outsider who's really looking at what's happening on the outside. I felt like there's so much that's happening for you and, like, you know, the movement that people see, and I have no clue what, what's on the other side. And similarly, like, a lot of times people, like, the past two years for me has been very hard. And like you said, even with the beginning of the call, that, like, you know, the work that we do at Art to Heart and myself. And for me, I think the past two years has just been like, I feel like I'm barely making it. Like, truly, 100% honest. 
barely making it. Right now, I am recording this podcast. I have a million mics around me. None of them work. I don't have a studio. I don't have a place to live. Um, so I, everything I had built in the past couple of, like, two, three years, I feel like everything's, you know, falling and, like, I don't know how to put it together. Like, there's a new change, but if it's good or bad, if it'll take away or it'll add something, like, those million questions. But here I am, just in these, these microphones or headphones. And just because I think, um, you know, we're both sitting here because I think trust and faith that we need to keep going. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. I think, um, oh my gosh, I'm getting, you know, I think, I, I'm, I'm so thankful you said that. And I, I think we're not, there's so much pressure to be extremely vulnerable on social media. And my art is about vulnerability. Yes, and so it yes. is the place, yeah. And it's the place where I process a lot of my pain and background and trauma and ideas about the world. And so, but it's funny because you get this little square yeah, and you get a little, Please, you get a little block to write some text in it and you're, and maybe a video or two. And you're supposed to like, you know, be to share your entire life as it goes yeah. and unfolds. And I can't do that. I'm, I think I'm a really private person actually, even though my art is very like in your face about lots of yeah, intense emotions and true. feelings, but I like leaving it in my art and not necessarily in social media necessarily. But um, so I don't know. It's been kind of a hard dynamic, but I so relate to you about barely making it. I mean, I, I'll be very honest. Like my bank account is negative a lot. Like I am not making it financially. Um, but... Oh my God. I love that. Oh my God. <laughs> because I think a lot of people think like, even with, I think we have to put it on. It's like, Thing. I'm not making thousands or like things. Of course, like I think I end up even putting back in the business. I end up spending so much more, taking so many more risks than um, just what I'm doing with and making. And also, like apart from this, I do a million more things to make sure that I I bring food on the table to like you know make sure I have that consistency. So that I think makes sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, it's so true. It's so true. And um, you know, I. I have recently um, become, you know, closer with an artist locally based in the in Wisconsin, and um, his name is Fred Stonehouse. And I heard him okay. speak recently, and he was saying that you know, if you're going to be an artist and you're like what he says, you know, a working class artist, which is what I relate to. My family is yeah. not like a fancy family. You know, we yeah. there's no art. There's not really, yeah. enough, there's no artists in my family. There's no sense of art. I, the first time I'd ever been to an art museum was, I was a senior in high school. I was 18. I was thankful. I, I was yes, thankful. yes. Oh my God, yes. Totally, <sighs> I love that. I. So it, yeah, it's a d- totally different kind of way of experiencing the art world. And, but he was, he comes from, you know, a similar background and he's become wildly successful. And he said something where he was like, you just have to be, expect and embrace like financial and like financial chaos. And if you can find a partner that is willing to like, yeah, basically be like to give everything to your art and just like be okay with that chaos, that financial and emotional chaos, you'll be okay. And so, you know, I, that is something that I've really like thought about lately. Like just, it's okay. Yeah. Like I, I love when artists will say like that it, the truth about what it is to be an artist yeah. and, Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think I think honestly, if you ask me, um, I think there are two layers to it. I feel like a lot of people, I feel, are not completely honest with what the definition of being an artist means. Like you know, uh, especially I think in today's time, um, let's say I feel like not everyone has a choice, and not maybe everyone wants. And I and honestly, I truly, from my heart of heart, never want. Others who feel that that they need to be in a crisis mode all the time. But I also like being an entrepreneur myself, being an artist myself. I feel like entrepreneurship and art, being an artist, are two very, very similar things. And right? mm-hmm. like any business that you build, being an artist takes a lot of investment from you and time from you. Mm-hmm. So expecting just results instantly and then taking them for granted, like in any other form of business, is not is not real. I think it's a very unnatural expectation and 
Um, it takes the work. It takes a lot of patience, like any other work business, for you to truly put yourself out there to, you know, make sense of things. And being an artist does not come with a rule book. So you need yeah. to figure it out for yourself. But yeah, also I think a lot of people being got it uh, honest. Like I associate myself as a creator more than anything else. Um, I even if I say financially, I make money in several different ways to make sure that I knew I didn't have an option to be onto someone, or I didn't have the financial structure to do that. And I knew that I needed to work things around and make sure that I do that for myself and still keep making the work. And sometimes it goes like up and down, and like that movement keeps happening. But this is what an artist life looks like to me for myself. And that may completely look different with someone else. But just the idea that there are so many possible ways of how you live and I live and how I choose to be an artist and how you choose to be an artist. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes. You know, it's it's funny. I um I, I had this thought once. I, I realized <laughs> I realized that a lot of artists in my circle did have some kind of inheritance that they could build upon. And it didn't have to be money, but it was like, maybe it was yeah. like a family that really loved art or, or even a money, you know, it was, there was, a, and I thought of my, I thought like, you know, what is my inheritance? Like, what have I, what can I build on that has been, it's like built within me from my bones since I've been a small child. And I was living in Portland, Oregon. And I had, I, you know, honestly, I had just gone through several traumas and ter- my 20s were awful. My 20s were awful. Um, my, my 30s have been great. I love, love my 30s. But, <laughs> um, but I was, you know, I was kind of seeking refuge in Portland, Oregon. And I, there was this moment where I realized I can't afford to be here anymore. Like I can't afford to live here and make art. And I thought, what do I have? And I, I knew, you know, I grew up in a very small town in, in rural Wisconsin and my grandmother died and I went back home for her funeral and I looked around and I realized that I could probably afford to make art full time if I moved home and it'd be very lonely and very isolated. Yeah. And there's yeah. no, you know, yeah. And there is an art community there, but it's much older and it's very based on yeah. tourism, you know? So yeah. it's not like the kind yeah. of art that I want to make, but since ever since I moved home, and I moved into like this little, my dad has like a junkyard. <laughs> and so I did, oh I got, there's this little tiny shack, like a little tiny shack, truly a shack. It used to actually be a refrigerator, like a walk-in oh refrigerator. <laughs> and we like, we like kind of replaced the walls a bit and like, but you know, there would be like bugs and sand in there every morning. I'd have to like, you know, sweep it out and no air conditioning. And it, you know, it was just not climate controlled, but whatever. I loved it so much. And I would like look out my door and there'd be like, bodies of old boats and tractors and cars. And like, it just felt like chaos. And you can really see it in my art because there's like objects and weird things kind of floating throughout and lots of nature kind of impeding on the bodies. And it worked out. Like it just, it was so beautiful and I loved working there and I don't work there anymore. I have, I've had a studio in between there and now I have my own studio in a building that um, my partner actually bought. Yeah. So it's been a huge progression and yeah. I don't, yeah. <laughs> Tell me something. Um, I, I really want to ask this for you for myself. Like, but if I move, so I moved back to my parents' house um, in between the pandemic, and then I now I'm, you know, oscillating between the small town, the big city, and just making things work. Because my partner stays here, I stay there, and then I felt like I needed to be here and everything. But I've had several fears, even though I feel like. Even though I feel like I have grown the most in the past few years from a small, very, very small town, which has no art community at all. <laughs> um, I still managed to a, focus on my work, focus on um, building art to hearts and just a community because I knew that I am not someone who likes to be 24-7 in the studio. I need to speak to famous people. I need these conversations because this is truly what gets me going. Um, but I think I wouldn't deny that I've not had fear that if I keep continuing staying there and not, you know, even though I'm the least active person locally, even though our Delhi where I am right now has an art scene, I really don't make it. 
I really am not a person who likes to go to parties, like events, and like, you know, I'm just not that. I just don't feel that way. But I think, what was your fear when it comes to like, did you have any thoughts in moving from the bigger cities or smaller cities, um, losing out on opportunities, not making it, or like things like that? Yes. I mean, I'm still really afraid. When I, I always thought, you know, moving back, I was hoping it would be temporary. Like I could save up money. Yes. 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 (laughs) But the more I stayed there, the more I realized like it's just so, I'll never be able to find a more affordable situation. And it just, so and it's so beautiful where I live. Like we're on Lake Michigan. Yeah. And so it just looks like an ocean, but it's all fresh water and oh, wow. white sand beaches and beautiful forests and lots of public I land like to explore. So I just, it's the beauty of my surroundings and the affordability. And I did get the opportunity to show a lot in New York and LA. So if I can yeah. get out and get yeah. to those cities you know, several times a year and show my work. That's wonderful. However, I don't have the day-to-day rub of, you know, connections that really like allows my work to flourish, you know, um, in a city. And I, I'm sure it's not good. You know, I I don't necessarily know if it's possible (laughs) long-term to keep doing this, especially I'll say like, Um, I've just recently, and this is really scary for me, and I don't necessarily know how to talk about it. And this is one of the reasons that I think I've put off this podcast is I I did have representation with the gallery in New York for a few years now. And it was the dream, you know, that's the dream. Even for people that live in New York, it's hard to get representation. Um, But I am a small town girl and I am. Oh my God, I love this. Yeah. And I am really sensitive. Like I've been through extreme trauma and I'm in, you know, I'm in trauma therapy and I really struggle every day with my mental health. Like it's not, it's not like I'm not healed, you know? And I, I, yeah. And so I have to be really careful about who I let in my life and how. And I I get everything yeah. saying. I feel like you yeah. like taking words out of my mouth. I, yeah. Sure. And I, I so I made the decision to leave the gallery I was with in New York. And I'm so thankful for the opportunity I had there. I had three solo shows through that gallery. Yeah. And I have to be careful about what I say, but I was really unhappy. Like I was yeah. really unhappy with that gallery. And it's hard to know, like you know, it's like you get your dream come true and it's nothing like you think oh it's going God. to be. You know? yeah. And where I'm happiest is just in my studio, in my imaginary world of my paintings. And so this year, I just want to like make everything about painting. I have one show I'm really looking forward to in February and it's in Wisconsin. It's in a museum and it's a beautiful space. Yeah. And I'm just going to work for that show and think nothing else. I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to go to a city. I'm going to spend every waking moment from now until February building a world that doesn't exist on this planet. You know, it's just completely in my, my own mind. And I am just, that's, that's where I want to be right now. I, I, I need to be in this imaginary space. I can't be in a city. I have to be exactly where I am and we'll see what happens next. I have no idea. I might've just made the worst career decision of my life. Um, but for my soul, but who knows? I, I, mean, who knows? <laughs> I, I think I get, I so get the only thing is that I'm so glad that you, you follow your heart and you've got at least an answer for what you want to go. And I feel like I'm exactly the same place when I move back to my parents. So I'm a small town girl called Heart and Heart. I think <laughs> I just, I just love the, A, I love the, the peace, the warmth, um, the slowness of that life, I just hate being a big city, running after things, commuting and making rents meet and then groceries and like everything is a struggle. Like it gets harder than it is actually. Then I similarly thought that I was going back to my parents' house just temporarily. And then I started staying there when my mom passed away, I had stayed longer and then it took two years and I realized I really like being in a, in a small town and I 
I had a beautiful studio that I was so happy with and like I felt close to nature, I felt myself and I felt content and I didn't feel like running, that I feel like the energy of a bigger city makes you. But then again, I my circumstances, I feel like I still don't have to get it out where I want to be. But I do get every bit of what you're Tell me something. Um, how hard do you put a lot of your emotions and vulnerability in your work? How hard is that for you? Like, when you started making the work, I know that if, if you want to talk about what figured your work, please, I, you would be more than happy to. But then, what about that? It's not easy to be so open and honest about what happened, what's happening to the group. How do you deal with that? Yeah. You know, actually, I feel like it's the easiest, most natural thing in the world to be honest about what's happened to me and my emotional life. It's harder to pretend like everything's okay. (laughs) So I actually, yeah. So I actually find so much peace in going deep with my pain. Like I just, that's where I feel like the truth of my life is. And yeah, so every like forced smile or forced interaction, and I struggle with the real world. Like I don't like small niceties and small talk and things like that, like that. I don't, I don't have a, it's really hard and painful, but like, it just feels so good to just live inside of the pain and go towards it because otherwise without that outlet, it will just swallow me whole and I cannot even live. Like I need to go towards it or it, it doesn't let me escape it. If that makes sense. Um, absolutely. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But then um, can you, can you talk about the work that you make and why you need it? So that everybody yeah. has a fun. Sure. Sure. So I, I, I'll start by just saying, you know, I, studied art, art history and literature in college. And I was so lucky to spend a few months in Italy, um, more than a few, yeah. yeah. And it was this just like intense boot camp with this woman who was, who did not speak English and my Italian is terrible. (laughs) And she would just, she really like believed in me and she would just, it was everything I could have ever wanted. You know, she really pushed me to attain a realism that I always wanted to achieve. And for a long time, I painted, you know, more hyper-realistic paintings. And wow. And then yeah. after, yeah. And then um, right after college, I got married. And my whole life I had been painting. Um, it used to just be like a, like a little watercolor you get from school. Yeah. And I figured out if I could add just a little bit of white acrylic paint to my watercolor set, I could make like these really like matte, really, I, I, it's funny because it, yeah, I, yes, gouache. And I, so it's funny because now that's what I, I kind of went back to the way that I painted as a kid recently. You're actually mixing watercolors with acrylic? Well, I use gouache now. I just use straight gouache, acrylic gouache. And, but it looks so similar. It looks really similar to what I did as a kid. But, um, but so anyway, I was painting at home and I, I had, I was, I I got engaged to somebody and we moved in together. And then I started realizing that something was wrong and I didn't understand what it was um, Mm -hmm. because I married a really kind person. I thought, or I was engaged to a really kind person. I chose them because they were very fun and sweet, but we were in college and there was a lot of partying, you know, that went on a lot of drinking with all of my yeah. friends and yeah. but he never grew out of that. And it got worse and worse and worse until I realized he was drinking from the moment he woke up to the moment he went to bed. And yeah. he was a very, very, very violent alcoholic. And I was, it got to the point where I was extremely abused and beaten on a daily basis. And yeah. I really feel like there, I, I could have died in that relationship. I probably should have died in that relationship. Sometimes I feel like I did die in that relationship. It felt so dangerous and so scary. And I think with a lot of domestic violence, 
with really smart men, yeah. <laughs> cunning that, men. That, I think we have this notion of if this is a person who could look like certain, but yeah. you know, like yeah, I mean, these are things that we nobody tells you. It, it does not come yeah. with a tag or a perception. Yes, and he was so. He was Polish and his nickname was Mishu, which means teddy bear. Like, and that's oh what people God. saw him as was a teddy bear. And he was when he was sober, but he was never sober in the end. Yeah. And um, so he, he, and I think it's important to say like, he was really good for a very long time about not causing, you know, physical wounds. Yeah you know, yeah. very like good at like a lot of like shaking and, yeah. you know, like I could go on and on, but there's a lot of ways you can be abused by a smart person who doesn't realize or they can like yeah. hide it. We would get the police called on us constantly. It was, and I would lie. I'd be like, Oh, um, we were watching a movie and Oh, you heard him shout. That was, he had a bad day. Like, I'm okay. It's fine. You know, I was, constantly lying for him. I didn't, he had isolated my, isolated me from my friends, my family. I didn't, he didn't want me to have a job. He, I didn't have my own bank account. I had no money. I had, he was in charge of my cell phone and he kept threatening to cut my cell phone off. I, it was, he had control my of family. every last piece of my life at a very young age. And How old I was, um, I think I was 23 when we got married mm -hmm. and I, and it how took, old was he? he was the same age. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it looking back, like I see a lot of the same, there were, there was just, there was so much pain and I have to be careful about how much I say, because I am, I'm still a little afraid of the yeah, consequences from, but I, I, I'll well, just, make you comfortable. yeah, no, but there was just one moment that kind of, it just, it, I never will forget it. I was painting on the floor of my apartment mm -hmm. and, you know, freshly out of college, like just excited about the world, excited about painting that, like, who am I going to be as an artist? <laughs> and yeah. as I'm painting, he's, he comes in and sits down next to me. And he looks over at me and he goes, I am so much better than you. <laughs> oh my goodness. And I just like, and then from that point on, if I ever took out my paints, he would get upset. He did not want me painting. Oh, and sure. I just, I just lost myself. I stopped painting. I stopped painting. I stopped doing much. I just, I poured everything I had into a literary magazine. Actually, I ran in a literary yeah, magazine with my friends. Now. Yes, paper darts for a really long time. And I kind of would, that's where I put my energy. Um, but I don't know. It's just the thing though, I, I want to come back to too, is he, when he started, when the, when the, when the physical violence started to get worse and there were a few examples, like I would get bruising or cuts or things like that. Yeah. Um, I had a friend mm -hmm. that got really concerned and she's like, what happened? And I'd be like, Oh my cat, you know, oh <laughs> I don't know. I was just trying to make excuses. And one day she came over to my house and she said, you know, if you don't leave him, I have to leave you. Like I cannot watch this anymore. I know what's happening <laughs> and you have oh to get out. And she said, yeah. I will help you. I will do everything it takes to get you out of this, but you have to leave him. And I, oh and she ran this paper darts with me, this like creative outlet. And this oh. creative outlet was so powerful to me. Yeah. And such, it was my whole world. It was, I had no world except for that. Yeah. And I, yeah. at that point I realized I need to get out. <laughs> it was exactly what I needed to hear. I don't know. And I, I, yeah. and then from that point on, I, it took a really long time to rebuild my life. And yeah. I, when I moved out my first job, cause I didn't have a job um, yeah. because he wouldn't let me have a job. So the first job I got, which was remarkable, I was illustrating short yeah, stories for my literary that. magazine. Yeah. 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 And so then I started, 
I got a job illustrating the Bible for children. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Which is so funny what because I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm not a religious person, but I did grow okay. up Catholic. I grew up yeah. Catholic. So, and it was a Lutheran Bible. And I, so I could kind of, I knew anyway, it was so yeah. interesting. And how, how I, did that contribute to your healing in any way at that point? Yes. Okay. I was like, a monk. I was like, I, I felt I would just go into my little, I had a tiny, this friend that helped me get out of the relationship. She was like, okay, your life is going to suck now. She's like, you're going to live in the worst apartment where you can only afford like a terrible apartment. You're going to live in a bad apartment. You're going to be broke. It's going to be hard. You're going to be sad, but it's going to be worth it. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Nothing I needed to more. hear that too. Yeah. Like, okay. Yes. I'm going to be broke. Okay. I love it. Let's do it. And so we oh, did, we found goodness. this like little tiny, 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 tiny apartment. I don't even know how it's legal to be an apartment, but <laughs> it, had a, it had a chandelier and it was like such a beautiful reminder of like, okay, it's so tiny, but it has a chandelier. <laughs> it was like, wow. And so I just, I just, and I drew everything on paper and then I would scan it in and then I would digitalize it and it would just take me yeah. all day. And there would just be stacks of paper of these crazy things. And it was so lovely and healing. And it yeah. went after that, I realized that I loved kind of a more playful style, more of a childlike style. And then I thought, what would it be like to start making like artwork that has a more playful, flat style? Yeah. And um, so that's kind of where I started pushing myself in a new direction. And yeah. <laughs> oh my god this is I am I'm just I can't even tell you like I knew that I would have I would be saying this even before we got in the call because I just with your words I could see so much of your strength of how powerful and how inspiring you are and I truly truly I think I exactly feel like where I where you like I am where you were and I truly I truly can understand how much courage um, it takes to just even come to the terms that this is what your life is going to be. And it will take a lot of courage and effort to flip it on the other side. And I did relate to the fact like I myself is like I was never a religious person. But ever since my mom's passing away and then a lot of things happened that were not so good, I suddenly started finding comfort in, and I wouldn't say I have become a religious person completely like, you know, but yes, I think whatever relief I could find, even if it was, if it was from some, some religious effort or something like that, and it, it does help because who doesn't like, I think it, when you're in a dark period, it's like, it's like every little life that you can find even if it's the weakest of it and you find like even if I can hold on to this maybe I'll make it through maybe I'll get to this maybe the next step and I, I truly I don't know it's just been two years for me and I'm sure it's just been more than that for you I I, I think I break down and I haven't said this I think like like we say like you know um Everything is always on the surface. Everybody thinks everything's great. You know, sure, I show up for things that I have to because if I don't, what's, what's going to keep me going? Like you said, um, but I, I break down a million times in a day. Last week, literally my sister had to come and take me and she was like, you can't be like this. You have to come with me. And like, that's, that's the thing of it. And, it's, it's hard to understand how trauma these um, works and how you process that. And how, um, I really want to know, like, what was the reaction when you started making art? Um, were you, like, you know, when I was seeing your work, I know, like, I saw this once the work, right? Where there's this window and then, um, the bo- there's like there's a boy and a girl like there's the whole domestic abuse thing. For me, let's say for my trauma especially comes from my mother passing away. It's still, to be honest, I can't look at her picture even today. 
uh, even today, just the mention of her name or just a second, like anything, or a lot of things that's happening around me triggers me like every second. Um, when I was, you know, reviewing that work, I was like, how much have it felt to you? Because it's like also confronting, like it's, you're putting yourself back into that situation. And you're really reliving, like every time I see my mom, it's like, I am reliving that moment. Like, I have to face it. Like, I try to escape in moments, like I know what this is, but I, I still don't find that courage. And when I saw your work, I was like, what, what world, what would you be thinking while making that work? Because it's, it's like, you go back into that moment. What would you want to talk about that? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, first of all, I'm just, I just like hear you speaking and I just, I feel so deeply for your pain. Like it just, it's so hard to keep going. And I think, I think it's just so beautiful to even just say those words out loud. Like I'm struggling, I'm struggling, I'm struggling. (laughs) And I think the more you can say it, the better. (laughs) I mean. It's beautiful, mm-hmm. but it's also like there's so much of guilt and shame associated with it, to be honest. Yes. yes. Um, and, like, you know, for me, um, I am the most sensitive one around. And I feel bad, but I also know that how do I stop? How do I stop myself from feeling things that I've been feeling for not today? I've had a very complex history since I've grown up. And like, I have felt things the way I have. And it's not like I'm on purpose. Like, they, yeah, sure, there are people who deal with trauma and grief in a very different way. Maybe, yes. But I don't. And sometimes I feel bad because I don't want to be like, I'm not seeking attention and I'm not. I don't want people just to associate with me, with, you know, with my grief. But I have also want to come to the fact um, that that trauma has also become a part. Like, it's not just one trauma. It's also so many unopened boxes that have now surfaced that I have to deal with them. And I am sensitive and I have to accept it and I have to keep trying. At least I'm not giving up. At least I think I keep telling myself, like, breaking down is still better than giving up breaking down is still better than because all these years like I had my feelings like bottled down like and like locked away and after my mom I felt like and then everything that happened I felt like everything just came onto the surface and like I want to know how did you like how have you managed that and also how has that impacted your work because you're putting that a lot into your work Yeah. I really, you know, I think I've needed different kinds of healing at different times. And I've been in therapy of some kind for the last 10 years. Um, I've been out of, yeah, I've been out of my relationship, my, my primary source of trauma for 10 years. And so congratulations. Thank you. But it's still so present. You know, it's still there. It still feels like the defining thing of my life. And right when I got out of it, I was walking down the street and I saw, I looked to my right. I still remember it. It gets me emotional to think about it. But I saw a piece of paper that said domestic abuse support group. (laughs) And I thought, hmm, could I? I be in that group. Am I like, I think what I went through was domestic abuse. I think it would be nice to be in that group. And it said free. I was like, wow, I need a free group. (laughs) So I, so I did make a call and it was a small clinic and they, they let me, you know, they gave me free therapy um, for a few years and I was able to, and it was with graduate students. So it was just with students, but they were so passionate about their work that it was some of the best therapy I've ever gotten. And I have so much, especially a few of them. I just, I owe my life to them. They really helped me 
get through it. And also being in a group therapy setting, um, and I've been in a lot of group therapy over the years, but it really depends on the, on the therapist leading it. And in particular, the first one I'd ever been in was really profound. And I was one of the youngest people in the group. And I remember thinking, oh, I'm so lucky because I'm in here when I'm young. And so when I'm older, I'm going to be fine. Like, oh, I'll get to this taking care this like trauma thing taken care of and I'll be fine. (laughs) But then I didn't realize that, oh, like all of their trauma happened when they were young and they were still reliving it. And I, I didn't, I wasn't prepared for the way that it stays with you. And it, 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 so I've just been through so many waves of different kinds of therapy. Like when I first needed help, it was just a really good place to just talk and just like have someone tell me over and over again that I didn't deserve the pain. And, um, And then after many, many years of still really struggling, and I actually had another traumatic event. Um, And every time there's more trauma on top of trauma, obviously it gets worse. But um, I actually had a stalker, (laughs) which was terrible. And and we had to go through court. um, And it was a felony level conviction, which is very rare for anyone to get um, their stalker into the court system and have it stop. And unfortunately, I wish it didn't have to go through the court system, but there's no resources in the United States for anything like this. And um, the stalker was able to get some mental health treatment through the process, which made me feel better. I felt like in some weird way, I was helping them get help. I mean, because there was some serious mental illness. But after that, I completely crashed and I was deeply suicidal. Honestly, I could not imagine how I was going to like, I just, if, if things like this were going to keep happening in life, I, I'm like, I can't do it. I'm done. I, I can't live. And I, um, I was able to find, um, like a more significant mental health situation. So I probably needed to be in an inpatient, but my insurance wouldn't cover it. So I got the very bare minimum that my insurance would cover to get an outpatient all day program just for two weeks, but they were able to it was a, a lot of education on how to just get through that really difficult moment. And also they would monitor medication as I was yeah. in front of them. So I had access to psychiatrists and therapists in the same building and also access oh, to other people that were experiencing the same thing. And that's not always great. It's hard to watch other people in pain, yeah. Um, yeah. but it was the next step of mental health treatment that I really needed. And I, I always encourage people. I think there's a huge like stigma around therapy is going away. Like people seem to be more interested in therapy, but there's still a huge stigma against like institutional treatment in that way. Like, you know, just like going in on a daily basis, you know, to a mental health. I mean, even though that, and I think I personally feel that because of the stigma, the, the, Lots of stigma around having therapy, but that's still a stigma around having mental health yes. issues. Mm-hmm. And more than often, I think they're taken too lightly. And like, it's like, you know, a pet talk would do, or like, a, you know, this would do and that would do. And yeah, I mean, probably in some cases where someone's just on the surface, so like, yeah, you get that push. I think you get that push in, like, elementary, but that's not how you solve situations that may not turn out to be bigger problems or lead to bigger problems. But I do feel like even today that um, truly someone who's not been through certain situations, it's hard for them to understand that how things unfold even when you don't want them to unfold. Mm-hmm. And that there's still, um, and, and people, I think it's also culturally, I think Culturally, it's also like, okay, some things have happened, and then there's this pattern that people expect, okay, you will take some time, and then you cope up with it. And yeah. if you don't, then there's something wrong with you. Then, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, and I, I think I've it's taken me a long time to feel confident in the fact 
and I get peace from this. I think some people don't like this. Um, for a long, even, even like, um, there is even a backlash right now against the idea of trauma. I don't know if you've been following it, yeah, but there's, yeah. there's a huge backlash yeah. against it. Right. And like the idea of it, just like we're too focused yeah. on trauma narratives in uh -huh. the past and in art. And I think, first of all, if you've been through severe trauma, that's so painful to have people say to you, like, or to even see it in the media and treat it in such a way that doesn't feel respectful or kind or nuanced enough for my taste. But so it's just, we're living in a world that just does not respect pain. And I know everyone's pain is different and it takes a lot of time and conversation and nuance and patience and space to really see someone's pain. And yeah, yeah I, I, it's, it's, I am just so frustrated, honestly. I think that it's, I've come to the place where if I, I, I don't have a lot of, I don't let a lot of people into my life very closely, yeah. but those that I do have in my life, I really need people that make space for me to be deeply sad. And I probably will be sad for the rest of my life. And that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. And like, just, I need people in my life that accept that. And the people that yeah. want you to get over it, I can't okay, then we can't, I won't, yeah. I will never be over this. <laughs> yeah. I think you're so, so on the spot on this because and I think a lot of people like, I think to each its own, I feel like, um, like you've, you've had not one form of trauma. And again, some form of traumas are on the surface where you can talk about and see and talk and like, so there's so many things that you don't talk about and that, may not be as significant as something major that happened in your life, but there are underlying layers. And someone may have a lot of more support and someone may not have had that. And that makes a lot of difference on how long they take, how they react, what they feel. Um, and yes, I do feel like, like you said, like I do feel like that 100%. Like today, I, and I think it's also feeling guilty, like, so many times I feel guilty and bad that I don't want to bring sadness to anybody else's life. And I do do make an attempt um, in ways that I know, okay, you know, this brings me join, this will bring someone else and join. But I also need to, like, I know that there is a part of me that, that holds that baggage, that triggers an unsurface where I really have one moment. And the next moment, it could be completely different. And there's very little I can control about it. What I can really do is break that moment and then find my people back again and pull it back together and find courage to start again. Yes. And I think if you find the right people in your life, like, and I totally relate. There's been so many times where I've like, I cannot call this person crying again. <laughs> like, I cannot do yeah. it. I don't want to do that to them. Yeah. But I do think it's nice to have a few different people you can rely on. Yeah. And it is important to always be able to feel like you can reach out. And I know for me, like, I need to go into this imaginary space of my, yeah. my creativity and my painting world because there are pieces inside myself that I can soothe myself with. And I think yeah. that's been really powerful to see. Like, I, you need all of it. And, um, but, you know, like, don't you – like even this conversation is so wonderful. I was just thinking like, this feels so good. Even if it wasn't a podcast, yeah. it just feels good to talk yeah. to people. And I, whenever I, whenever someone tells me something really painful, I always say to them, well, you know what? Like, I'm so glad we're talking about this now, but let's talk about it a hundred more times because yeah. there's like so much to mine there. It could never be yeah. one conversation. It's going to be yeah. a lifetime of conversations about this thing. And, and that's what I want yeah. from people too. It's like, we have to keep going there to kind of really make it feel safe, even in the small yeah. ways. Yeah. yeah. I think that's, and you know, for someone like, you know, like for someone like me, I have a, so ever since like everything happened, I, I'm a person who shuts down very quickly because that's how I grew up. I grew up like, is there something that I'm processing? Like I feel I need to bottle it down and then shut it down. Like as a child, I didn't tell I had enough space with my ocean. 
when something like this happened, when I lost my mom and everything started to roll, my life started to spill over. Um, and then I completely shut off people because A, I didn't feel safe, and B, my natural response to um, feeling such emotion was that I had to shut everything off and just, just disconnect. It was just this, the thought of heart to heart. And like, there was one little love part of my life that I owned, that nobody had a fit in, that didn't give away too much of who I am. Because for me, my natural response is to completely shut off. Like, shut off. I think, like, it's so bad that I, I reach a point that I don't even have words to say. But then, this was one little part. This has been one little part that has, I think I keep saying that, like, these conversations, everything that we do, even though it gets a lot of overwhelming, but it's also one of the reasons that I wake up in the morning and I'm like, something I will do in my day to day that will bring me excitement and that will make me happy. Even if it's like, you know, it's just that one desire that keeps me going and that was it. Like, my dog, yes, I know you have. I have two dogs, and I think they are so much, so much a big part of everything I am because there's no other form of love I know more better than that. I think I don't know what. I think I truly feel being seen and touched and heard and healed. The wisdom that I've ever in my life has come to anybody. I love that. I, I really hope that in the future there will be more um, understanding of the way that dogs in particular can heal I trauma. Swear. I swear. I swear. Yes, I totally agree. And I, I have um a little Chihuahua mix mutt who I love with my whole heart. I and yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> and he, for a while, I was working with a therapist and we got him certified as a support or as a service dog. But yeah, and he really would like if I had, I was having such an issue after my stalker in particular being in public yeah. because I felt so yeah. seen because yeah. sometimes I would be observed. And I didn't know I was being observed. And I just, I, I, and if I had this little dog and I could put him to my heart, yeah. I could feel his little heart beating and I could just like, I would calm down and it would go from like have feeling like I was having a, you know, a panic attack, a heart attack. Sometimes I wouldn't be able to get home, you know, without this little dog yeah. and I would bring him everywhere, everywhere. And but I honestly got so much negative feedback from people yeah. saying he's too small to be, a, you're lying. He's not a service dog. You're lying. And I was like, it, it became so much like negative feedback around this tiny little dog that I stopped bringing him in public. And I, and it, it now he, he, I still get some therapeutic, you know, he, he's great, but I hope that in the future that there's more, like there's more room. And I've seen on Instagram, there's a few small Chihuahua service dogs that are doing the work. They're doing the advocacy work, but there's something really special about them. And I think yeah, they're I think my dogs are just dogs. Like I, they just, like, but they brought me like support and like a space that I needed to be myself. Uh, I needed, I think it's hard. I think for someone like me who's, who struggles with words when it comes to expressing what I'm feeling in the sense like I don't know when I switch on this mic and I I think even if I was like not talking about this like now like this it's a little trickier for me to talk otherwise but um when I come on the podcast or like you know related I think it's just the creative energy or like because I feel like I know that someone who's felt similarly and who's also creative because I feel like as a creative it adds another layer. I just feel like I know that it's because of who I am and what I do. I think more deeply. Um, and it makes my situation a little more different than normally like someone else. But I think like, um, they just, I think for someone who feels scared of taking space and saying words and being scared of what people will think and like, you know, all of those things are just shutting down. I think 
my dogs were one way that I never had to feel like I had to shut off with because I never had to speak. I never had to pretend. I never had one thing that I just had to be myself. And that was like, that was something I needed so much. And yes. yeah, I, I think more and more people need to recognize that for sure. Thank goodness. <laughs> okay. On that note, tell me something. What, what about you working in the small town brings you joy now? I, I'm really interested because I feel like my heart was there too. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm so lucky. I share a studio with the artist Claire Cat Erickson. And oh. so she's also, you know, obviously working in my little tiny town. And she is an like, like a world class artist. Like she is, I believe in her work so much. I love working alongside yeah. her. It's amazing. I really do think you need a community of artists. Like I don't think I could live there. Even just one. I mean, there's other artists in town that I'm deeply inspired by, but working side by side in a studio where we can just like come together and then go back to work. I mean, it is, it, it has changed my life. So I, I deeply enjoy her and just having found her. Um, and then again, just like the nature, the nature and the affordability. That's I why I'm there. That. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I came to a point in between this that I was really struggling with my work because making art for me needed for me to be in a certain space. Um, and since I was making all the time and I was like, I didn't have a space and I was, I had to do what I had and I still am in between. I felt so much pressure personally that I felt like I was showing myself like I'm not doing it and one day I was like you know what I want to remove this pressure of making work because I have to prove someone it has to be a special artist it has to be this that I'm just going to make art because I need to make art and there's no other way I, I, I think I can and that brought me so much joy the day I decided I wanted to just make for myself with no pressure Otherwise, I think it was killing me. How how have you felt about that? Because you recently mentioned you getting your experience because you probably because you felt that pressure. Yeah, I I think that I need to make art to survive, and that's not yeah. really that's not really like something that there's a lot of people that don't like that idea. You know, like art yeah. is supposed to be something more removed. I don't know. I really like the idea of making art that feels really steeped in art history. And I, I, I try to, I try to code at art at, at every angle. Like I want it to be in my mind, fit in an academic world. I want it to fit inside of a pop culture world. I want it to fit inside, you know, the high New York art market world. I want it to fit inside of my small town I want to make art that my parents can understand and like they don't necessarily yeah. like that, whatever it's fine I'm trying um but I think that it's just I really do want to make art from lots of different angles but if I'm honest the reason I'm making art is because I just deeply enjoy it and that is one of the reasons why I did want to step away from the gallery I was working with because I wasn't enjoying the process and the way that the gallery wanted the artwork to come out and to live inside of the world that they had created for the work. And so I'm just so excited to go back and really make work for myself and to make it without the pressure. And I've let go. I've just let go of like the idea that it needs to be you know, for anyone else or to be accepted in any yeah. way. Yeah. It, if it's accepted and it finds its world way in the art world, great. And I think, you know, there's so many women artists that have made art in obscurity and have made art from yes. small towns or made art while their yes. kids are, you know, great. And we have so many of these examples now. Um, even Georgia O'Keeffe, who I love and was actually yes, born in Wisconsin, yes. you know, going and, and working away from the world a little bit. Like, I think that I'm just to the point where life is long, hopefully. And yeah. I just want to trust that the world of my painting, if I put everything real into it that I can, 
it will find a way out into the world. And I remember this is so cheesy, so forgive me, but like I remember being in in college and in painting Absolutely. and being like, oh, if I if I can't imagine how good it would feel to make a painting that just one person was moved by. Like it felt like <laughs> the most amazing possibility. Like just one person could like see themselves in my work. I would feel so good. And I've, I've achieved that. I think, I think I've at least made one person. Uh, <laughs> okay, good. So I've made you. A part of the so I think like, it's just, yeah. And if I even just like keep that mentality, just like, okay, if there's just one person that connects to this painting, I'll feel okay. Like I just need to go back to the basics and hope that things work out. That's all I have. That's all I know <laughs> at this point. <laughs> My goodness. I am so, 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 so happy that you find this out because, you know, I knew, I just knew. And I think, honestly, if I were being honest completely on the show, I don't think I've ever seen someone so hard as much as I have. <laughs> honestly, no, it, it's nobody. And there's so many times that I even like someone just said, like, okay, I'm not someone who just, like, I will take a follow up on two or three and I'm, but there was something about you, uh, you know, when you see someone, you feel like, I really want to speak to this person. And for me, my podcast is just that. I want to speak to people that I truly want to speak to people. And like, I, sometimes I was like, and I, I asked myself this question in a lot of times, like, why am I circling back to her every time? And I feel like oh I have my answer. And I'm just so glad we finally made this through because I'm, I, I'm, I'm just so grateful. Oh my gosh. Thank you it's, so much. It's my first podcast I've ever done. So I <laughs> was terrified. And thank you for your persistence in getting me here. And I, it's just such a joy. And it's because I respect what you do so much that I wanted to make sure that I was up for it and knew who I was. I do think that I know who I was. I am right now because, you know, honestly, I, a year ago was when we really were going to try to do this. Yeah. My, like, I, I really got my heart broken in the, yeah. in the art world. Like the art world has broken yeah. my heart a little bit. It's not an easy world. It's not a kind world. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so I, I was really questioning about whether or not I wanted to keep making art to be honest. Yeah. And, and not that I, I would not stop, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to keep doing what I had been doing, if it was worth it. And I've taken the last year to know that I do want to keep doing it. So I just really appreciate you letting me come back and really to say that to myself, no, even I, here, like I will keep I going in this scary, yeah. scary world. And it's an honor to and I love that you. because I completely <laughs> feel the same. You know, there's so many times like I keep questioning why am I sitting here right now fully my life? Like there are four million reasons just to keep going and that I want to but also because I knew, I knew for a very long time that I'm not, I mean, even before starting, I told you, like, it, it does not matter to me where I am going to be, but if I'm not a person who likes to go, like, I love meaningful conversations. I don't like to go out to parties, attend events, make small talks. I'm a person who beats talk. And it's not that easy to have those conversations with anyone and everyone. And I knew, like, I I have never felt myself in, in the art world, especially like people around me have or like uh, where I'm sitting right now. And I had to be okay with the fact because I felt hurt and like, you know, whatever that was. Or not hurt, because it always felt like an outsider. For so someone who comes from a different city, no background, I have always always felt like an outsider. And then one day I was like, I know, I know even with this podcast that I'm not alone. There are so many people who feel the same every day of my life. But I still want to make, I still want to be an artist. I still want to meet other artists. Maybe I just don't want to be a part of this kind of a world. Because I don't have any like, but I just don't see myself in it. I was like, if I don't want to see myself, what's stopping me to live the life that I want? Or make the life I want. That means if I need to, and that I think that's also how um, my mission to work and what we do at Art, what we started with this community. And I was like, 
you know, I just, of course, I want community, but I also want empowerment. I also want an open world where we, where we're like, I love working with creative people, like artists, like have these conversations. And we are the artwork. I do not have to be part of those X, Y, Z and so many other elements. And I don't have a problem. We, if there's like we align for sure. But it took a lot of courage and acceptance that I should be okay that I don't want to be a part of what's mainstream and what's actually what it. And I'm okay with if I need to create a small little world that makes me work. And where we can do what we want to do. And that's how we came on to like, you know, I really want others. Like even when we spoke, like, I really want others to have thriving business, money making businesses and creative careers. Because I know what it feels to be starving. I never wish anybody, anybody. And if that takes lifetime to figure out how women artists can can live a life that their heart to be desired. And not compromise their authenticity and their creativity. Yes. So be it. Yes, absolutely. I so agree. I so agree. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be a part of the community that you're building. And it's really, really I'm special. So you're I'm amazing. Right. You are amazing. I'm so right. Okay, but I have the rapid fire still pending. I can't let you go without that. Okay. 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 It's a rapid fire. There's no okay. right and wrong. Okay. So give me I'm ready. Time to okay. I'm okay? ready. One, two, three. Here we go. One thing you want to convey to your work in the art. Honesty. Love that. What's that one word that describes you the best? Emotional. <laughs> if you could have a studio anywhere in the world, where would it be? LA. Your biggest source of inspiration? Virginia Woolf. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your favorite woman out there? Oh. Any point of time. Anybody. Could be your, I, think I, I love so many. Happy. I love so many. Um, Quick. Okay. Okay. Frida Kahlo, I'll have to say. I have to say I Frida Kahlo. I, I, mean, I knew it. I think I just said that it would be that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Who's your go-to person when you're in trouble or in need of advice? <laughs> The woman who got me out of my marriage. <laughs> Your partner, the one that you were running pay for that, right? Yes, yes, Jamie Millard. <laughs> oh, wow. We need more people like this. We do. We <laughs> love more people. Okay. I'm really curious about this one. This is more than one word for sure. Okay. I'm sure you must have had many. But what is one moment can you recall that you really cherish? Like moments where you feel like I'm truly like. I feel so grateful for being an artist, like to me to do the work that I do. Like some moments that you really, really touch and feel like full circle. It makes you feel like yeah. I think my very first solo show in Minneapolis just the opening was a big success and it just was like the moment where it felt real <laughs> yeah yeah no absolutely okay if you were to meet younger Meg today what advice would you give her don't get married um <laughs> young don't get married young um and Terrible things will happen to you. <laughs> and try to find the teensiest shreds of beauty in those experiences and keep going. <laughs> keep going, Meg. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. One last shout out to an artist among who, are, who you're currently loving on social media. Okay, well, definitely Claire Cat Erickson, my studio mate. I love her so much. She's so good. Um, it's She Devil on Instagram. And uh, oh. yeah, and her work is really special. It's like um, taking a look at, you know, 
what it's like to be a black woman in rural America. And wow. it's so powerful. And I get emotional thinking about her work because I love it so much. I think she's just brilliant. And I, and I watch her struggle to just, you know, make ends meet too. And we, and, and she deserves all the fame in the world. It just drives yeah. me crazy. So I think, um, I think she deserves a lot of love on social media and she'd make a great interview yeah. too, but her, yeah, she devil, Claire Cat um, Erickson. We'll connect with me. You'll connect perfect, with me. Perfect. Perfect. We'll that then. Let's have one on. Great. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Meg. I am so glad. It's it's wonderful. It's so so nice, honestly, to speak to you. I think. Oh my goodness. I feel like I just came out of therapy session. Oh my gosh. Me too. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness. Have such a good night. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Okay, one before I go. Yes. Anybody who's listening, where would where can people find you, support you, anything that you want to share? Yeah. Any oh my goodness. Okay. Well, I think um, just find me on Instagram at Meg Lionel Murphy. And um, I also just opened a little tiny gallery and shop called the Hours Gallery. And that's based in my little tiny, tiny town. So, um, but oh, it lives wow. on Instagram too. So we're just building that up. It's brand new. And that's another fun place to find my little world that I'm making. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll see you soon again. Hopefully, very soon. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. You can find all the details and links mentioned in the show notes of this episode available on www.arts2heartsproject.com. And if you like this episode, please don't forget to tag us in your stories and leave us a review here on iTunes or any of your favorite platforms. It really helps us to keep the show going. Thank you so much. I'm sending you lots of love and I can't wait to be back here soon again. Bye.